Hello, we are Team 1UP, and this is our presentation for the Nintendo development cartridge for our senior design project here at Oregon State University. I am Neil McCullough. My name is Paul Malloy. And I'm Linus Garrett. And today we're going to start with the overview and history, then we're going to talk about the requirements and block diagram, and then we're going to finish up with the current progress and the future timeline. So the NES is one of the most uh, popular video game consoles ever, being about 25 years old. There are still people who develop games for the Nintendo. One of the main reasons is because of its simplicity. It actually allows an individual to create a game in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, these developers have created several software tools that have allowed them uh, to test the games, but there's still a need to test the games on the actual console and prototype different hardware configurations. One of the main difficulties with a project like this is something called a mapper. There are many mappers created and they were added to the game cartridge to allow the re to expand the resources that are available to the, that game. <clears throat> For the resources currently available to developers, we have a socketed donor game and the power pack. For the donor game, you have to pull the cartridge out of the Nintendo, <clears throat> pull out the memories from the sockets inside, put the memories in an external programmer, put them back in here, put the cartridge back together, put it into the Nintendo. It's a slow process and you're limited to the hardware configuration of the board, more specifically the single mapper contained. <clears throat> As for the power pack, uh, it has a large library of mappers available to developers, but it is inaccurate and it is not compatible with Nintendo clones. So our solution, which is going to be better than both the socket donor and the power pack, will be versatile by allowing multiple mapper configurations. It will be compatible by working with the NES as well as NES clones. It will be open source and it will be quick to program by using a uh, USB interface. Now we will discuss the block diagram and the requirements. The organization of the block diagram was broken down into three main sections. The first section is the host software, which I will be discussing. We have the programming interface, which Neil will discuss, and we have the NES interface, which Paul will discuss. The first main requirements that we needed to cover were that it be quick and convenient. So for it to be quick and convenient, we made a host application that the, uh, NES, or the, the user will select their NES file, and, and which will have the game data in it. They'll choose from preloaded mapper configurations, and then they'll program via USB to the controller. Now if the user has selected the fast program option, what that will do is it will compare the current uh, programmed game to the previous program game and will only program the bytes that it needs. Also, um, what's really, uh, what we'll also have is a, will allow the users to create their own mappers if they decide that they don't want to use the pre-programmed ones and they'll use this using a graphical IDE. W once they have their mapper created, what they will do is they'll program via JTAG directly to, or through the host PC down into the CPLD. Another advantage of uh, having the USB is that the power will be supplied um, while the thing is being programmed and while the NES is off. So that means that we do not have to have the NES on and we can also have it plugged into the NES. Also, another advantage of the USB is that our firmware, if we need to update it, it can update directly through USB using a bootloader. This means that it does not re require a separate programmer. Uh, for the programming interface we're going to use a microcontroller uh, to transfer the game data between the host PC and the memories. Uh, we're going to have to remove the inputs to the memory uh, such as the mapper and the NES so to accomplish this we're going to have a mapper disable signal uh, on the, the mapper here and then we're also going to use a data buffer in order to remove the NES console from the memories during programming. Since these memories are large parallel memories, we're going to have to uh, IO extend the microcontroller. Uh, that way that we can reach all addressable memory on board. After we have finished programming the memory, we need to communicate back to the host that we have completed this. Uh, and during testing for the NES, uh, there's possibility for the NES to change some of the save data. So we want to be able to read from the memories back to the host PC this data. So it's going to be kind of a reverse of programming to the memory. We could actually or save the file back to the host PC. So with the NES interface, there are several things going on with the 72-pin connector. 
Uh, the first being the power from the NES. Supplying 5 volts in our power distribution will be regulating that down to 3.3 volts to supply power for all of our equipment. And this will also provide everything to be powered when the host is not available. The next function is the uh, circuit checker. Nintendo actually created this device as an anti-pirating tool uh, to prevent uh, non-licensed games from working. It would actually reset the NES every second. And so we will actually have this circuit on board communicating back to the NES preventing these resets, allowing the user to work with our development cartridge on an unmodified uh, NTSC Nintendo. Um, all of these components on board will fit inside of a original sized NES game case. Uh, and then all of the uh, communication data, which is the address and the data buses, will be communicated through a data buffer because the NES operates at 5 volts, whereas all of our equipment operates at 3.3. And so the level shifting will be done here to, to change those logic levels. Now, the memory is split up into banks. And the way it's set up is the mem direct memory communication is comprised of the data and the lower address bytes. So those will be communicated directly to the memory where the mapper actually controls the high address bytes to allow for bank switching of the memory, providing more uh, memory space for the Nintendo. And this communication is actually done through our buffer directly to the mapper uh, where it will then control those banks. Additionally, the mapper is used to create certain functions as uh, interrupts, allowing for users to create more complex games. And this communication will occur directly from the mapper through the data buffer back to the NES console. For the last part, we're going to be discussing items that we've already completed, things that we're currently working on, and our future goals and timeline. One of the first things we did was emulate a simple mapper on a CPLD. And how we did this was we took an original NES game and we removed the mapper chips. Uh, we then emulated the mapper on the computer and flashed it onto a CPLD and routed all of the signals uh, to and from our CPLD development board. We were then able to plug this into the NES console and test our mapper. The next piece of hardware that we have completed was the protoboard. And the protoboard was used for uh, prototyping purposes. It allows us to hold our memories while testing our NES interface as well as the mapper interface. So as you can see here, we have our memories on the board and then we have the NES interface at the front and on the back we have access to any of the mapper signals and we can tie directly into them. The next, uh, or what we're currently working on is the host software. The, what we're trying to do now with that is we're trying to be able to program the hardware via USB. And Neil's going to talk about the hardware. Okay. For the hardware, we have a small microcontroller and a small memory. Uh, and the problem that we ran into here is that we had a large mess of wires and it was very difficult to see what was going on. So for what we're going to try to work on in the future, is porting this over to a larger microcontroller uh, and as you can see on the board here it's still going to be uh, programmed via USB uh, and then what we're going to do here is we're going to take the NES proto board and we're going to plug it in here and then we're going to be able to program uh, the SRAM via USB and then this board is going to be battery backed so we can remove it and transfer it to the NES for testing. For our future timeline before starting the winter term we want to be able to program all memories through USB and have our final PCB design completed. By the end of the winter term we will have our working prototype and we will reserve the spring term for project improvements. In conclusion today we've given you an overview of our project, gone over requirements and block diagram and given you a status on our current progress. So just remember next term when you see us playing video games 
that we're not goofing off. We're diligently testing our final design.